I'm going to start with a true story. Uh, I, uh, I won the National Design Award a couple of years ago, which is... <laughs> and they, they hold this very fancy uh, reception and, and, and ceremony at the, the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York. And there was a cocktail thing before. And I was nervous because I had to give a speech. And so um, I had a couple of drinks. And this woman comes up to me, uh, very nicely dressed, and, and she said, I just want to say, I, I love your work. I'm retarded. <laughs> and I thought, why did you say that to me? <laughs> That's not funny. But I, I felt I had to respond somehow. So I said, um, well, it's funny. You don't look retarded to me. <laughs> <laughs> and her face darkened, and she said, I said I'm with Target. Oh, uh. <laughs> the department store. And you said, you don't look like you're with Target to me. <laughs> and she sort of <laughs> turned and, and walked away. So um, that's a kind of like microcosm of my life. Um, I, you know, for all the like success, um, I, I get things turned down and rejected all the time, and I have to see it sort of as an opportunity to do this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cover a couple of future and recent book projects, and and I'm gonna uh, wrap with the Batman uh, Death by Design graphic novel. Before you start, let's just j j just let me ask a very basic question. Mm -hmm. um, where, why, when did you know, was it at university that you first thought, I'm interested in graphic design, oh, yeah. I want to yeah. look yeah. into I'm, it? I majored in graphic design at Penn State University right. from like freshman year. Right. So that was always, it was just going to be a, a matter of um, what kind of graphic design. And I ended up in books and I, and I love it. Take it away. Uh, well, this, uh, uh, this is a, actually a magazine cover. Uh, Time hired me to do um, this kind of like end of the aughts thing about how horrible it was and how better, how much better it's going to get. So um, I set up a basic cover in type. I printed it out. I crumpled it up. I walked around with it in my bag in New York for a week and then took it out and photographed it. And um, <laughs> that's what I turned in. And, the art director loved it, but he said, of course, you know, we have to get the editor-in-chief on board. And the editor-in-chief said no, um, because our subscribers will think that the postman mangled it. Right. And, and, and they'll return it. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize that your subscribers were total idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the end of that. Um, no redo. Uh, this is something that's coming out next spring, um, and it's interesting in, in publishing. Um, this is a really, really good, uh, vital book. But they started out with this title that I thought was really stupid. Um, you know, and this is one of those things where it's really the subtitle is what it's about, and the title is, it's like they're just trying to be clever, and, yeah. and it's, it's just wrong. And so they actually came to their senses, sort of, and then did a 180 and made it, it's like this declarative uh, statement, which I thought was really great. And so I took the idea of the Red Cross and turning it on its side so it's an X and made of pills and, and whatever. So this was it for a while. And then um, they added a subtitle so that it's not just a total downer, that, that there is some, <laughs> is some way to help. Um, and, th and I thought this was perfect, but then they went back to the sort of, <laughs> you know, catchphrase title. You're not making this up, no, are you? No, this, this is, is all okay, okay. real. And um, so that's pretty much how it's, it comes out next, uh, next spring. And is that the one? Sort of. It's lucky they could fit in a bit of design on that cover. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it.
Uh, but yeah, do 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 those? Not, um, is it particularly non-fiction books that, that the titles change? Yes. Or does that happen with novels and not not so much, right? Uh, it can happen with a novel. It's not as uh, it's not as common. And of course, you are employed by Kanaf as a as a the, the head, perhaps staff designer. I'm associate art director. I'm not the head art director. That's a woman named Carol Devine Carson, and I wouldn't want her job for all the money in the world. <laughs> right. Uh, but of course, you are a um, you know like. Uh, the first, one, one, not the first book I noticed of yours, but one of the first books I noticed of yours, and of course one that was important to me, which I'm sure some of you have seen, was the hardback of Wind Up Bird Chronicle, which is, you know, and, it's, and that's what made me kind of, I'd seen covers of yours mm -hmm. before, but that was the one that made me, because the, the page numbers are going around the edge, the design, it's both laminated and right. embossed. It's they, very you know, complicated. It's very complicated. And I should also mention, I did a TED talk earlier this year in March, um, and that's online, and I'm not overlapping anything here with that, but there's, it's about book design and, and the process, and also sort of in praise of books on paper. Right. Uh, but I end up with uh, design for um, the new Murakami novel, which is 1Q84. Great. So this is a case of um, hiring freelance designers, wonderful designers from Philadelphia named Heads of State. Uh, and it's about the, the battle in Congress of the two divided parts of it, and they can't get anything done. Um, and these guys came up with like six or seven usable. Hold uh, on, these are these are out. This is outsourced work. This is outsourced work. work. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and they're from Philly, so they're local. But they're right. really, really good. And uh, so it's kind of like the mechanics of Congress. This takes the whole keyhole thing and it's like turn literally turns it inside out. It's like, where are you? Yeah. That you are spying on Congress this way. Um, this was interesting, um, you know, conceptually very strong. I think um, the editor had a problem with it because it implies that there are two domes of Congress and there's only one. Right. <laughs> they can get very literal. Uh, you know, the spinning top, which is really nice. But this is the one that we sort of went with, um, balancing act. and. Uh, uh, so anyway, there's a whole hierarchy of approval, our editor-in-chief, the editor, um, and then it goes to the author. The author does get a very strong say, mm. and the author said, you know, it's, it's interesting and nice and attractive and there's a concept, but there's no human element, like these guys are fighting all the time. Can you add that? And, and I think um, he actually improved it. Um, so this... This, it can be a process, and, and the authors can have good ideas. Well, actually, um, you know, uh, it's quite, um, you know, like a lot of the authors complain because the cover people don't appear to have uh, read their books at all. Right. And you once told me, which I thought was great, that it's actually, in a, sometimes, it's not important to read the book. That can get you bogged down well, in I, something where a simple knowledge of what it's about and the title of it and the, can and be more helpful to The Congress you. thing was, was a total example of that. Right, exactly. Um, this is something that came out about a year ago, and it's, you know, this is quite a story to tell, and it's by um, this gentleman, Skip Gates, who you may or may not know of. Um, and it's, um, it has a ton of imagery in it, but he wanted a cover that was like outside of time. So, you know, it's got all these iconic images, but they're all tied to a specific time period. And um, so what I did was I focused on the subtitle, which is looking at African American history, and I decided to let's try making the jacket about looking. And so, uh, and I did research to to make sure that this idea had not been done before because it's so obvious. And um, so anyway, so we go live with it. Uh, it, it's a November book. We go live with it in June. Meaning it goes into a catalog or... Yeah, yeah. And it goes on Amazon. Right, you can right. pre-order it yep. and all of that. And so this is good. Everybody likes it. And, and so the summer goes by and then it's Labor Day. And I go up to the house in Connecticut on Labor Day and I check my email Friday night. And um, I have this uh, subject heading. <laughs> and I'm like, it's Labor Day weekend. It's Friday night. <laughs> To double click or to not double click? <laughs> because we know whatever this is, it's gonna be bad. Was it the third exclamation mark that gave it away? Uh, yeah, <laughs> so basically I'm like, duty calls, so I double click and what happened was, Gates' assistant had just come across this on Amazon. 
Oh. This book was going to be coming out in September, and our book was coming out in November, so it would make us look like we were right. copying them. And so I had to start over. And so it truly became Labor Day. And um, again, you know, here's a painting from the interior, but it's, it's very rooted in its time. Uh, this, frankly, was too erotic, which mm. uh, didn't bother me. But uh, <laughs> then I went back to the original um, and introducing elements of the American flag. This didn't quite do it for everybody. But then I thought about, OK, looking. Let's look with two eyes instead of one. And this became the answer. And I think, arguably, it's the strongest cover. And of course, you have to imagine what mm. it's going to look like when you shelve it. And it's only spine out. And so there's more witnesses. Um, just to, um, may I, do you mind if I interrupt every now and then? Uh, you, can, you can steam through if you like. Okay. It's so good. Well, just when you present, are you at the stage now where when you, obviously you have a great reputation and everything, but are, are you at the stage where you don't kind, you just show the book and you kind of don't bother to explain your oh, thinking? Oh, I never, ex I that's never what explain. I'm, that's what I'm wondering. I never explain because. What, what's the point? What's the you point? Know, they, you can't explain it on Amazon. You can't explain it in a bookstore. Yeah, so. exactly. So Augustin Burroughs is best known for um, Running With Scissors. This was going to be his book on Christmas uh, uh, essays and about how horrible Christmas is. And so um, I had this friend who was a photo photographer named Tom Allen who had a blog that he made called The Twelve Tawdry Days of Christmas. And, he went into the local Goodwill and would buy like a cheap, awful Christmas gigaw every day and photograph it and put it online. So I said, you know, there was that one figurine that you shot. Can I use it? And he said, sure. And he, so, you know, it's this like sub Hummel thing of this girl in a winter coat with a wreath freaking out. Um, why, we don't know. But so I sent it to Augustine and he said, well, this is cute, but it's not mean enough. I'm, I'm really a mean person. So I went back to Tom and I said, remember that other Santa Claus ceramic candy dish you had? How's that? And uh, so he sort of added this to it. And I said, well, that's interesting. But um, instead of people, why don't we try firearms and turn them around? And uh, it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of getting there, but now let's bring back the little girl. <laughs> and so, and now it completes the narrative. We know why she's freaking out. So this is a freelance job. I send it off. A week goes by and I hear nothing. And we always know that's the kiss of death, because if they like it, they tell you right away. And if they don't like it, that if you don't hear, that means they don't like it, mm. or and they <coughs> they don't know how to tell you, and they probably reassigned it. Um, f f finish that. Finish this story. Okay. So the other thing was um, the art director finally called me. He said, "Yeah, it's not working for us." And we also had a ten-minute discussion in the marketing meeting this morning about whether or not Santa Claus is showing the little girl his penis. <laughs> <laughs> And i thinking, what, the firearms aren't enough for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but it's, I'm pragmatic. So I said, well, do they want him to? <laughs> and he said, no, really? they don't. So he said, do you want to quit or keep going? And I'm like, I've got to keep going. This should be so easy. So um, I thought this would be the answer. You know, what other crazy thing do people do at the holidays to celebrate? They, they dress up their pets. and so. Um, you see all of this on all over the web. So what says let's celebrate our risen lord better than clamping a pair of bunny ears to your cat or making him a sacrificial lamb or my favorite, the quacky hat. So these have the right tone, right? But it's the wrong holiday. So let's get back to Jesus's birthday. And uh, I want, the, I want the pet to look angry. So he looks very angry. Uh, this is just 12 kinds of wrong. Um, this is very Dr. Seuss. But I thought this guy was good. I mean, he really, really looks upset. So I'm going to give them two. I'm going to give them this one. And then 
Uh, Augustine actually has a pit bull, and I found this, and I thought, this is, <laughs> this is really, really perfect. Like, I'd really like to think that the photographer had his face bitten off, like, right <laughs> after he took the picture. So I'm like, yes, I've aced it, and a week goes by, and I hear nothing. And um, two weeks go by, and third week, he said, yeah, you know, uh, these weren't working for anybody, so we solved it in-house. And then it's fun to see when the book actually comes out and you see what they did. This is real. <laughs> so the whole Santa penis thing, they changed their minds. So you are employed by Not and also do things... I sleep around. Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, and uh, that is... Do you find that it is... Well, obviously, it's, it's, all, it's harder to do yeah. it freelance than yeah. to do it within house because I, I can meet personally with the editors. I can meet personally with the marketing people um, it, with Knopf. And here, you're just at the mercy of everybody else. Right, right, right. This is a Knopf book. Uh, Alan Holland. Yeah, just one more question about that one. Is that an example of something where you've been through the most amount of changes for, and in the end, nothing happened? I mean. I don't keep track. But uh, an example of roughly one of those things? Yeah, but I, yes, but I felt that I really nailed it like twice. Right. And they still... Well, it's because they haven't been clear to you about what they want. Well, yes. Or they don't know what they want, right. which is why in the end they steal your idea. Right. And come up with a nasty cover. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. So, uh, this book, uh, it's a wonderful novel, spans the 20th century, but it's really about this enigmatic young British oh, poet, great book. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he publishes one poem and then goes to World War I and dies in the trenches. And, um, but he also, he had a, a roommate at Oxford and meets her sister and they're sort of a love triangle. They both loved this guy. So this was my first attempt, and this only went as far as the editor. She said there's too much um, going on here. Uh, too many ideas, it's too confusing. So uh, there's lots of action at beautiful British estates, and this introduces the idea of three people together. Um, but uh, so the editor liked it, and the author thought it just looked too much like a book about British gardening. So then we, we go to Oxford, and this just looks too much like a book about Oxford. Cambridge? No, I think is that, that is. Is that Oxford? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this is sort of me being desperate, or let's get in the heavy <laughs> metaphorical mode. You know, the brother and the sister are, are represented by the swans, and the, the poet's represented by the statue in the cupola, and they are swimming around him because they love him, and they can't have him. And, <laughs> so nobody's buying this one. And so then I was in my um, partner's apartment in New York, in Soho, and one night, despairing over this, and then caught sight of, of, of this painting that he's had for a couple of years now, which I've always liked. And it's an unfinished painting by a painter named uh, Eugene Spiker. And um, I was just thinking, wait a minute, that's him. That's the guy. And we can't know him, but we sort of know of him. And we have an idea of him. And that just became the cover, and, and this was instant. Like, everybody loved this, and it's the best thing. We ended up with the best thing. Um, how, how different do you find, oh, I mean, I've, from my own career, I've noticed that America and England has astonishingly different attitudes as to what makes a good cover. Right. Um, have, you, have you found that? And oh, yeah. The British cover for that was a, a, yeah, hed a hedgerow maze. That's the one I've got as well. And it's not terrible, but it's not, there's no, again, there's no human element really to it. Not your stuff, but I find a lot of American cover art uh, comes with, I mean, uh, you know, one very basic image that tells you a lot about it, whereas English covers, I find that they're, they're a lot fussier. Generally. I tend to, to focus on one thing. Um, now, that said, uh, David Rakoff, wonderful writer, um, and his shtick was that he gets assigned things by magazines that he's not qualified to do, like uh, go whitewater rafting, and he's right. a wimp. So I wanted this book to look like it was something other than it is. So this is making it look like it's like life cereal. Um, 
which is, you know, for every demographic. Uh, nobody liked that. I've always been fascinated by advertising for erectile dysfunctional medicine, <laughs> uh, which is the visual vernacular of this, because, of course, they can't show the product in use. Right. Uh, <laughs> They can only show the product after use. Uh, so as you see here, nobody liked this. Nobody understood it. Uh, this seemed a little too obvious, but I liked the handwriting. And then um, I thought about, all right, so I buy this book, right? And I'm starting to read it. And I'm thinking, this guy is a fraud. <laughs> this guy's a fraud, man. So what do I do? I take out a red magic marker and I do that to it. You know, it's just like work out my frustration. And I continue reading and I'm getting angrier and angrier. So I do it on the spine and the back too. <laughs> and especially over all those quotes telling you how great he is. <laughs> and this did it. Uh, everybody liked this. And it really looked like somebody wrote on it. And there he was at the reading. OK, this was fun. Um, I got a freelance job uh, uh, to design the Bible. <laughs> and the, the art director said, we want you to think of it as an epic work of fiction. <laughs> and I said, well, you're in luck, because that's how I've been thinking about it for quite yeah. some time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I found this incredible photograph by this guy named Andre Serrano of yeah, sure. the Morgue series, where he was in a New York morgue. And uh, this, I thought, was amazing because it looks like it's alive and dead at the same time, uh, which is a great theme of the book. And uh, I thought, they'll never go for it. But you know, anyway, they did go for it, um, partially because the translator was dead, so he was very easy to work with. <laughs> um, but because Andre Serrano had also done Piss Christ, uh, the, this jacket was a total disaster. No bookstores would carry it. Oh. It was, it was guilt by association. And when they went to paperback, then they did that, uh, of course, without me. And it's, that's an object lesson. And it's not what you show. It's how you show it. Because it's yeah. still the same thing. It's a dying person. It's a person who's being murdered that way. Right. It's just pretty now. What happens when, when at what point did they just, anecdotally, at what point did they get the news long after it was printed? Yeah. And it, it got a lot of notoriety, and, and the jacket got into all the design competitions. Like, design-wise, it was a huge success. Practically, it was a total disaster. Right. Um, I'm often asked, I've written several novels, you know, and I'm asked, do I design my own covers? I, so, I do. I sort of orchestrate them more than anything. Uh, my second novel, The Learners, which they have in the vitrine there, is about the Stanley Milgram um, obedience to authority exper experiments in Yale in 1961, where people were tricked into thinking they were shocking and killing people on the other side of a wall that they couldn't see. Uh, but they heard screams. And, and so I wanted it to be an updated version of Monk's The Scream. Uh, using an illustrator named Charles Burns, uh, whose book Black Hole I was publishing at the time. So I'm, I did Swipe and put this together to get my publisher on board with it. Um, switched out my name with the title so it's more symmetric. And they said, OK, this is great. You're done. And I said, no, it's going to look like this, only it's going to be a lot better. So I get Charles on board. This is a horrible drawing that I did to, um, to guide him. And uh, this is the photo uh, reference uh, that I gave him. And he's fabulous. So he goes to pencil. And then he goes to ink. And then there's a shock machine. Oh, and then on the back, my eyes are closed. So then there's a shock machine that people are being shocked. Uh, so that's the reference to that, and he does that. And then I got my friend Chris Weir to do the lettering, um, which is so beautiful. You have good friends for co-designing yeah, yeah. I mean, an it, album cover. To get Chris Weir Burns to do your lettering like this, it, it's like uh, getting Frank Lloyd Wright to design a shed or a dog. <laughs> um, so then put it all together, and there it is. And so it, you know, it's the same design. It just looks a lot better. It's finessed. And uh, when you take the jacket off, um, you don't get the, the mouth, you get the, the shock machine. So that was fun. 
Um, three years ago, I did exactly what we're doing here uh, with, uh, um, at the 92nd Street Y with um, Neil Gaiman, the writer Neil Gaiman. And we geeked out on stage about Batman. I'm a huge fan. Uh, this is Halloween 1968 in Red, uh, West Lawn, Pennsylvania. That's me on the right, uh, my brother, two years older, on the left. He got to be Batman, and our mom in the middle, she's Batmom, and she made those outfits for us from scratch. So the, um, I may look like this now, but inside, that is me. Um, <laughs> I've never gotten over my Batman fetish. So. After this talk with Neil Gaiman, um, the editor of DC Comics uh, comes backstage and says, oh, you should do a Batman story for us. And I'm like, don't tell me that unless <laughs> you really mean it. And he said, yeah, yeah, I really mean it. Just follow through and do a, do a, a, a outline and character sketches. And you can, 110 pages, you can you know, like do whatever you want. So, it was like, oh my god, I'm a lifelong fan, but it's not like I had a lifelong story to tell. Right. So I had to think about what am I going to do, and this is, people know me best as a designer, so this title in 70 years of Batman stories had never been used. So I thought, all right, I'm, you know, I'm, you should start with a story, but I'm starting with a title instead. And then I thought anybody who does a Batman anything, whether it's a comic book, or a TV show, or a movie, or a cartoon, um, you ask yourself this question, because it's a very strange thing. And basically, it's about urban injustice, and Bruce Wayne can get certain things done outside of the system this way, by dressing up as this thing. So I started to think about, what kind of urban injustice do I encounter in New York every day? And going um, up to uh, Connecticut, Mm. I'm in and out of Penn Station all the time. And as most of you may or may not know, it's just horrible. Mm. It's a nightmare. Um, this is Penn Station, which is basically a horrible, airless, fluorescent lit basement of Madison Square Garden. And of course, it didn't used to be that. It used to be glorious. And almost as a cruel joke, they have these pictures of it <laughs> above the trash can. Um, <laughs> And they're not even good prints, they're shitty prints. But it's basically like, ah uh -huh. look how look how Penn Station used to look, sucker. <laughs> um, so it was amazing, and it was destroyed in 63. And the only good that came out of that is that it led to historic preservation in New York. So I was thinking about, all right, there's going to be an element of that in this book, this is visually what the book looks like. Uh, because this is what I always wanted to see when I was a kid. Uh, great black and white uh, Germanist expressionist uh, thing. The artist is a Liverpoolian named Dave Taylor, who was found by DC Comics and willing to devote three years of his life to the project and um, was very good at faces and very good at buildings, which is very important. Uh, we modeled Bruce Wayne on Montgomery Clift, and of course the first decision was what does his hair look like? Um, and the upper left hand corner was the winner, and then he drew what he's going to look like in the mask, because we wanted it to look like you know, he really is wearing a mask. And then I uh, was able to create characters. I created a female um, lead, and, and this is her, and um, in the 70s, uh, they, the developers also went after Grand Central Station, and they wanted to demolish that. And the single person that stood in front of the wrecking ball was Jackie Onassis. And so this character is Jackie Onassis in this role, but looks like Grace Kelly. And she's trying to save the old Wayne Central Station that Bruce Wayne's father had built in the 20s, and is marked for demolition at the beginning. And so, uh, you know, it's very much, you can see it, the, the work of the hand. It's very much pencil on paper. Um, it, it takes place in the 30s. We don't say exactly what year. Uh, but this is you know, Batman listening in on a mob um, meeting with a special device. You know, ah, um, love this. You know, love her. She's great. 
Um, this is actually um, Batman looking through a dirty window, and we're on the other side of the dirty window, tumbling through space. And um, I got to be a fantasy architect. Uh, there's a, there's a very much an architectural uh, theme to um, the book. And I came up with the idea of like, what if you're at the intersection of 57th Street and 5th Avenue, and there's like a 50-story skyscraper on each corner, and you took the world's biggest sheet of glass, and you just rested it on top of those, like the world's biggest coffee table in the sky. And that's your nightclub. So poor Dave has to draw this thing, um, double page spread announcing the, uh, the ceiling. And across the top, Bruce Wayne is calling Cindy Asil to ask her on a date to go to the opening of it, because the architect of the ceiling is this um, Dutch guy named Kem Roomhouse. <laughs> And he's an asshole. <laughs> um, so we start with blue pencil. And um, at this stage, we can correct anything easily because it's non-photo reproducible. So you know, DC Comics, this is how we would do each page. So DC Comics approves it. And then Dave goes to pencil pencil. And we love this. So now he scans it in and just adds some subtle lighting effects, like the um, wow. the, uh, the searchlights and, and what have you. And then just a little bit of color, which you'll see in the street below in um, like the peach uh, color of the street lights. And that's it. That's our color. So there's the opening of the um, ceiling. And Bruce Saint Wayne says, so what do you think? Well. As long as I don't look down. Oh, oh my god. Um, and things get dicey because it turns out that the head waiter is the Joker, uh, who has laced all the champagne with laughing gas and is going to rob everyone. And I also got to create another villain. And this villain's name is Exacto. And he is Batman villain as architectural critic. And so he basically just kind of appears and says, well, you'll see. All right. So the Joker's robbing everybody. And from the bottom right, it says, for a comedian, your timing is lousy. Bang! Uh, Joker immediately shoots him. Bullet goes right through. Hmm. And you are? The stresses on this structure were improperly calculated. It cannot sustain the weight. You must leave immediately. And then the architect who's hiding under the tablecloth says, what? You're mad. OK, kids, game time's over. This is no game. Hundreds dead on the street is not sport. Oh, I beg to differ, four eyes. How dare you? <laughs> and of course, this great big crack forms in the whole thing. Everyone head for the exit. Stay calm. Yes, everyone stay calm. Kick back and relax. I warned you, idiots. Boom, boom, the struts start to go. I warned you. And this is a, a, a great improvisation on Dave's part. The original instruction for this panel was just a crowd of people laughing. And then he stuck Batman right in the middle of it. And he's like totally like helpless. They don't even realize he's there. Like, how is he going to save the situation? So boom, he uses his new grapple gun that he was beta testing in the first scene of the book. Uh, <laughs> boom, this will buy us all of two minutes if we're lucky. And so it, it's just enough to keep it up before, uh, so everybody can get off before it just completely goes. And of course, all the Joker wants to do is fight. And the Batman is Batman saying, not now, you idiot. And he's saying, no time like the present. And then we didn't use any other further dialogue or sound effects. That was my favorite shot. That's what I want to see in the movie. No, you know, like sound would be like the cars distant down in the street. And the Joker sort of has the upper hand, and then Batman flips him over. He's about to fall, and Batman catches him just in time. Hurry, pull up. And then Joker says, oh, as if. <laughs> and his hand pops off, and down he goes. Uh, and this is only 20 pages into a 110 page book. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, were there any ideas? Because obviously, it's a uh, they're in charge of Batman. Yeah. 
they're in charge of Batman. Yes. So they look after Batman forever. So they were, do. There, were there any ideas where they went not our thing or too sick or too not nasty enough or anything like that? They were great. Um, I had a very good editor, and there were two main things because. I, at first, I had this abstract idea that, oh, the Wayne Central Station is going to be knocked down. And um, this woman's trying to save it. And my editor's like, why would Bruce Wayne allow part of his father's legacy to be destroyed? And it's like, oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer, and it's problem solving, fun. Yes. And so uh, the answer became, well, be, so that Batman can build a covert transit hub underneath the new station so that the Batmobile can get anywhere it needs to get underground. <laughs> geek, geek think. And then the other thing, they were cool with everything else except one character at the end was going to um, guess Batman's identity by just his voice. Right. Because he knew him as a child. And they said, you know, that's, that's a no-no. We just don't. Which is we funny because it. it seems like in the movies, in the everyone, movie, everyone, in the movie, they all like, oh, well, we know who you are. Everyone. It's like, I'm not exactly Christopher Nolan. Right. So, in a, yeah, right, 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 right. So that's, and you know what? I, I can accept that. Mm. You know, I just, I, I got Different it. rules for different Batman. It's a different, different rules for different creators. And, and mm. that, you know, that was all right. It wasn't a big deal. Right. But that was it. Everything else was fine. Tell us about the, uh, how did working, with the, you, you were kind enough to give me the Superman books last time I saw you, mm -hmm. oh, and I left them at your house, and then you sent them on so kindly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you, uh, how was that, dif how did that differ from the Batman experience? Well, the, the thing about that is, um, this is something called All-Star Superman, and that was strictly about, uh, <laughs> sweet, uh, that was strictly about doing the design scheme of the cover. Right. That's it. Right. You know, so th this, for me, was a first. That, right. Where you're, I'm telling the story and I'm right. art directing the right, art. Right, and, right, right, right. Uh, but that that was great, and that was working with Grant Morrison, and and he had to approve it, and Frank Miller had to approve it because he was doing Batman and Robin. And will there be an, will there be another? We'll see. Great. We'll see. I hope so. Um, you know, because that's something that's obviously so dear to your heart. That yes. must have been a particularly meaningful thing for you. And I know also you've worked on books, you know, for example, that you know, your partner's written and stuff like that. Yeah. What, what, el what else are other things you can think of that just really meant a lot to you that you felt deeply involved with? So much. Really? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I've been so incredibly lucky. I've been so incredibly lucky. And the, the next thing I'm doing now is, which I'm really late with, is um, a book, book to teach graphic design to children. Oh yeah, you told about that. Um, and uh, um, another question is, uh, obviously, in fact, let me look at the time. Perhaps we should uh, kick it open for a few questions. That would be really nice. So think of your questions yeah, in the Q, next Q, couple. Q, Q, Q and A as well. Um, um, <clears throat> I yeah, I suppose the first Q, and Q, Q of the Q and A should be, is it okay to do a Q and A? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but without, without any undue modesty, not, not a lot of graphic, not a lot of book designers, for example, have, mm -hmm. you know, monographs come out about them. I know there's been at least one about mm -hmm. you, and I know there's that mm -hmm. huge and beautiful book that you did the right, explanation for, which is quite one of the most beautiful, beautiful, kind of, was that a monograph as such? Yeah. 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 Um, wh wh why do you think it is? What do you think you, what, what do you think's got, got you to that point? You know, being modest. I mean, why, why do you think it is that, that you have, whereas there are a lot of book designers who just haven't? Because my name sounds like a porno star. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's, it's, I think it's two things. My name goes on my work, and I work for Knopf. And, and Knopf lets me do beautiful things. So, and, and, and I think it, the accretion over the years of the work is, is the reason. Hmm, hmm, hmm. And I, 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 I do think that's and what it, it is. is. And it, but it is not only <clears throat> original, I would say, but it's also identifiable as yours. I remember a time when I was, I think I told you this story, but I was in Japan, and mm -hmm. I love Haruki Murakami, and mm -hmm. the, my Japanese publisher very kindly gave, placed a copy of The Long Goodbye on my, you know, it was only Japanese, it was only in Japanese, it had been translated in Japan by Murakami, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they wanted to gift me this copy of the book. And uh, a copy you'll remember very well, because the first thing I said was, oh God, that looks like a Chip Kid cover. Mm -hmm. 
knowing it couldn't be because it was, and it was. Right, yeah. So there must be, even for somebody who's not a graphic design expert, like, there must be something that seems chip kiddy about chip kid things. Well, but I, I think I have more of a sensibility than a style. Uh, I really try and reinvent the visual look of things each time. Uh, so yeah, I think it's much more about having a sensibility. And it, so let's, let's open it up for 10 minutes of questions. Who, does anyone have one? Yes. Um, I know you've done a lot of like archiving cartoons and comic books and stuff. Mm -hmm. like, guys like Alex Ross, Charles Schultz, Dave Gibbons. Mm -hmm. Is there any more of those projects you're kind of interested in doing at the moment? Or? Um, I did a book called Batmanga, The Secret History of Batman in Japan. And, and um, I'm working on Supermanga. And we'll see, it, which will be even more obscure and more cool. Um, so that's, that's what I'd like to do next in terms of that. Yes? Any design for a topic or a book that you have no interest whatsoever in? Ha! <laughs> yes, of course. Um, you know, you were, you're, I, I've been at this for 26 years and counting, so, and I work nonstop. So inevitably, you're going to get things that you're not that interested in. Um, the trick is to make yourself interested in them. I think where I've been very, very fortunate is that I haven't had to work on a book that is written in order to make other people think like an asshole. Um, <laughs> and I'm really, really glad about that. And, a, and a, a prime example is there was a guy on our staff who left. He was an assistant, or, uh, you know, a junior designer, and he left to be the art director of HarperCollins, which was a big step and a big pay raise. But one of the first things he had to oversee was the memoirs of Sarah Palin. <laughs> and I'm quite honestly, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> uh, that would, you know, and it's funny, but I, I know. And this was at the time, you know, of the election and all of that. And I, I haven't had to do that. And uh, that to me would be a much, much worse horrible thing would be to, you know, I can work on something that bores me or that I don't think is all that well written, uh, but something that's amoral or, or against And is asking you also to make something attractive and viable well, yeah, yeah. you help find people, repulsive. Help people, you know. It might actually have an effect on an election if you made, made a book cover that was great enough yeah, that it sold I, millions I, I said of to Archie, I'm like, how can you do this? And he's like, it, look, it's my job. That's what I signed on for. And his politics were like, much more left than mine. I mean, mine are pretty left, but he, he, just, he compartmentalized. It's like, that's my job, that's what I have to do, I did it. Yeah. I remember um, uh, you, you were talking earlier, I remember a time a, a friend of mine's book came out. It was a book about being a host, the history of being a good host. There was a mm -hmm. chapter on Hitler in it and how he was you know, a horrific person, but was very solicitous about his guests and their, their, what they wanted. He always served meat, though he didn't eat it. And it was about the history of hostliness from Greek times forward. Mm -hmm. And they gave him the cover of the thing. It was a very plain cover, which they got from the stock photography library. Mm -hmm. And the same week as his book came out, there was exactly the same stock photograph on another book. Exactly the same one, by complete coincidence. Well, that's the, the art director has to be on top of that. Don't know, that's, that's, pure, that's not good research in the age no. of the internet, is no, it? No, it's not. Well, it's exactly the same as the Gates. Was it the Gates book that had the right. similar cover? Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. And I remember when I did the first, and <clears throat> I found actually that um, publishers are very, very good at listening to me. I mean, either it's, it's great when they hand you a cover and it's great, but the first cover they gave me of my first novel, it was so horrible, I can't tell you. It even had some, it actually had pubic hair on the cover. It was so disturbing. It was a guy hiding behind a library of books, but you could see, like, it was horrible. Wow. And I said, I just find that. And they said, well, do you have any better ideas? And I sent them an image of something. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they made it into a great cover. But I know people with nightmare stories. Do you ever have people... I mean, obviously, you, you, you may or may not talk to all the authors. I'm assuming you do. I, it all depends on if they want to or not. Right, 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 right. Anybody uh, questions? They don't have any mind. Yeah. Um, I just have so many old books that I just love to look up and love to feel them. Mm -hmm. I just have a series of them. I remember loving um, Little Journeys to the Homes of the Great or something like that. Mm -hmm. Books that you remember first just thinking it's just such a great cover, just, just all the way it 
Uh, books that I just loved in general, like uh, Charlotte's Web or um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, anything by Dr. Seuss. Those all had a very strong visual vocabulary that, but, but, but helped me to have an emotional connection to, to the material, uh, you know, which, which that's what the text does. But that, and then of course comic book covers, uh, which, which also. Does it go yeah. farther back as well sometimes? Well, I would have been a zygote at that point, so I. I <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, no, the, the very rich history of the book cover in, in the 20th century, yeah. Uh, it goes back, I mean, <sighs> Ulysses, you know, has had wonderful covers all kind of like through its history, and uh, the Faulkner original uh, first editions are beautiful, Hemingway. But the, bu the book cover, it's the, the, paper, the, the paper flap, what's that called around the it's book called cover? The, the dust paper, jacket. It's called the, the flap. The flap. That thing's a fairly recent invention, isn't it? I mean, like beginning of the 20th century? Beginning of the 20th century, and, yeah. and beginning And originally, book collectors threw them away. Yes, it was like candy, it's like, it's like candy bar wrappers. Yeah, it was like, yeah, no, why, you don't need to keep this cover. It seems lunatic now. Well, you know, that's, and that's why if you <clears> have a, a jacketed, First edition of The Great Gatsby, you know, you can right. It's you can retire. Yeah, you sell it. It's but it's amazing how recent it is, really, because of course I suppose before that a lot of books came with their own stamps on the cover right, and yes, designs binding. in the surface of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I would just like to say, the library, we do have another display of your book cover, so if anyone's interested in seeing more examples, please come over. It's hard to find the library. The doors on the parking lot for the time being. And well, thank you. I appreciate it. I want to check it out before I. And then I'd like to ask because I think of the students here. When you left university, what was your career track? How did it go? It happily, it's not a very interesting story. <laughs> uh, I had a portfolio, and I knew I wanted to be in New York, and I knew I wanted to do graphic design, and I had. I was lucky. I had a good friend who could put me up in their apartment in Williamsburg uh, until I got my feet on the ground. And I uh, cold called and got in to see people and showed them my work. And everybody was really nice. Uh, but the, the, really, the first substantial job offer I got was from Random House as assistant to the art director at Knopf to, to entry level designer. And it wasn't really what I had in mind, but I thought, bless you, I thought, Let's give it a shot and see what happens. And it's been 26 years. What is the name of that oh so beautiful book I'm thinking of, the really big one? It's called Chip Kid Book One, Work, 1986 to 2000. And yeah, that, okay, they, they got, that is, you must go and check the book out because really it also tells that story very, very, you, the story of your progress yeah. in book design. So yeah, you can and, see your first book, do, and, you know. And John Updike did the introduction. That's right, I mean, it's beautiful. I got writers to write for it beautiful. and now some of them are no longer with us. So it, it was, that was an amazing thing to put together. And it was a little weird. It was like presiding over my own funeral or something. <laughs> but, um, but I'm, you know, I was so privileged to be able to do mm. that. Mm. Go ahead. Yes. I love Edward Gorey. Uh, I had a poster in my cubicle in college of the Gashley Crumb Tinies. Um, he did book covers yes. in the 50s. And they're quite, I didn't find that out until much later That's in the right. game. Yes, he did. And amazing. Modern library stuff amazing. as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved his humor and his sensibility. I wouldn't say that graphically he influenced me all that much, because I'm not a good illustrator. Uh, and, and rarely actually try to illustrate, but um, definitely appreciated him, definitely liked him. Someone over one there. More? Yeah, last one. Um, what, some of the covers I particularly like of yours are the ones like the Oliver Sacks, Mind's Eye, or James Cook Faster, where you're, it's typography, it's not just typography. But it's, it's a conceptual. Image. Yeah. I, wonder, I mean, does your working definition of image include words, or do you really think of the two things as separate? Oh, I love combining them. Yeah. I love combining them. And I, that's part of what I'm going to try and convey in this book for kids mm. is you've got, you've got form and you've got content and then you can, and then you can merge it. 
and when you merge it and merge it in an interesting way, that's when graphic design is really, I think, most interesting and most effective. And uh, so the idea of, of a Oliver Sacks book about how eyesight works in the brain uses the visual vernacular of an eye chart, but parts of it are going out of focus because basically your eyes are starting to go. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in that kind of thinking. And, 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 and I, Penn State, where I went to school, was very good about teaching us to think that way. Do, do, you, think, um, do, do you think that, uh, that do, you, do, you often, do you often think, oh, you know, I design books, I'm, I know you've done some records, mm -hmm. uh, you know, do you ever think, oh, I'd like to actually do this, I've never done that before, you know, but I'd like to do a calendar, I just have a particular idea for it, or I'd like to do well, I'd like a, to make a film. You'd like to make a film. Yeah. Yeah. Would Would, yeah. What kind of a film? Well, I, uh, The Cheese Monkeys, my first novel, has been optioned ad infinitum I know. and it's gone nowhere. <laughs> uh, and, or, or, the, or the second one. I, 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 mean, I mean, every novelist thinks this, but either of those, I think, could make really, really good movies, interesting movies that I don't think would cost all that much. Would you make. like to be involved with them? I co-wrote the screenplay for The Cheese oh, Monkeys. Oh, right, 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 right. And that was fantastic. That, that was like, I think, I felt like I got a chance to, re, to re, go over it and, and correct some mistakes, some flaws that are in the novel. I think the screenplay's actually better. Hmm. I am going to draw that to a close, but I can't imagine that that could have been more interesting, funnier, or a better look at what you do. Well, so thank everybody, you so much. a round of applause for Chip Pitch, who I'm sure will be happy to sign your book. That was wonderful, Chip. Thank you.